The Battle of Waxhaws was fought on May 29, 1780, near Lancaster, South Carolina, between Continental Army, led by Abraham Buford, and a mainly Loyalist force led by British Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton. There's much controversy that surrounds this battle, and today we're going to take a look at the Battle of Waxhaws. So, Colonel Abraham Buford commanded a force of about 380 Virginia Continentals, including the 3rd Virginia Detachment, composed of the 7th Virginia Regiment, two companies of the 2nd Virginia Regiment, and an artillery detachment with two six-pounders, which didn't participate in the battle at all. Most of his men were raw recruits with little battle experience, although Buford had experienced officers under his command. Due to delays in outfitting his command, Buford had been unable to reach Charleston to participate in the siege, and Buford was eventually joined by about 40 Virginia Light Dragoons who had escaped the siege or during battles outside the city, and by Richard Caswell's North Carolina Militia. Receiving news of the surrender, Buford was ordered by General Isaac Huger to return to Hillsborough, North Carolina. He turned his column around and headed north. At Camden, Buford and Caswell parted ways, with Buford heading north into the Waxhaws region. Buford was accompanied for a time by South Carolina Governor John Rutledge, who had been actively recruiting militia in the backcountry. When Buford stopped to rest his troops at Waxhaw Creek, Lutridge rode ahead towards Charlotte, North Carolina. General Henry Clinton of the British learned of Huger's and Rutledge's forces, and on May 15th, he ordered Lord Charles Cornwallis to bring South Carolina and Georgia backcountry under British control. His army, though moving too slowly to keep up with Buford, Cornwallis decided on May 27th to send Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton in pursuit with a force of about 270 men. The force he took in pursuit of Buford consisted of 170 British Legion troops and British Army Dragoons, mainly light dragoons, 100 mounted British Legion infantry, and a three-pounder cannon. Tarleton sent Captain David Kenluck forward to the Rebel Column, carrying a white flag to demand Buford's surrender. Upon his arrival, Buford halted his march and formed a battle line while the parley took place. Tarleton hugely exaggerated the size of his force in his message, claiming he had 700 men, hoping to sway Buford's decision. The note also said, Resistance being vain to prevent the effusion of human blood, I make offers which can never be repeated, indicating that Tarleton would only ask once for Buford to surrender. Buford refused to surrender, responding, I reject your proposals and shall defend myself to the last extremity. Buford reformed his troops into a column and continued the northward march with his baggage train near the front of the column. Tarleton, in violation of accepted rules of war, had continued his march while the parley took place. Buford's position was in an open wood to the right of the route of march, with all of his infantry in a single line. The American colors were placed in the center of this line, and Buford ordered his men to hold their fire until the British were within 10 yards. Around 3 p.m., the leading edge of Tarleton's force caught up with Buford's rear guard. According to a Patriot eyewitness, the five dragoons of the rear guard were captured, and their lead leader, Captain Pearson, was inhumanely mangled by saber cuts, some inflicted after he had fallen. Seeing the rebel line deployed for battle, Tarleton divided his force into three attacking columns. He deployed 60 British Legion Dragoons as well as about the same number of mounted infantry as the right column with the intention of having the mounted infantry dismount and pour fire upon the Americans, pinning them down. At the same time, he formed a center column of his elite troops, the regular soldiers of the 17th Light Dragoons as well as 40 Legion Dragoons to charge straight towards the American center under the covering fire of the Loyalists to their right. The left column was led by Tarleton himself and consisted of 30 hand-picked men of the British Legion ready to sweep the American right flank and drive for their baggage and reserves. Tarleton kept his single cannon in reserve with the remaining Legion dragoons. As Tarleton's cavalry tore Buford's line to pieces, many of the Americans began laying down their arms and offering to surrender. According to Patriot accounts, Buford, realizing the cause was lost, dispatched a white flag towards Tarleton in an attempt to surrender exactly when differs among the accounts on both sides. 
However, Tarleton was trapped beneath his horse, which had been shot out under him during the surrender, and there's a good chance he may not have ever received the surrender flag. Although Patriot accounts say that a surrender flag was sent, they differ both on who carried it and how its messenger was treated. Loyalist and British troops were incensed at the betrayal, and fighting continued on both sides although the white flag was visible. The conflicting Patriot accounts agree that flag was effectively refused. None of the British accounts of the battle mention a surrender flag even being sent. Buford and some of his cavalry barely escaped the battlefield. Just as quickly as it had begun, the Battle of Waxhaws was over. British casualties were slight with 5 killed and 14 wounded. The Americans lost 113 men killed and 203 wounded. Colonel Buford managed to escape from the slaughter. He reported what he saw on the battlefield to Patriot officials and the effect was electrifying. The Battle of Waxhaws became known as Buford's Massacre, and Tarleton, already known as an aggressive commander, was condemned as a butcher. The British reported that all wounded of both sides were treated fairly, as was custom of the day. Tarleton, in a version published in 1781, said that the battle was a slaughter. He said his horse had been shot from under him during the initial charge, and his men, thinking him dead, engaged in a vindictive asperity not easily restrained. After the battle, the wounded were treated at nearby churches by the congregants, one of whom was young Andrew Jackson. News of the massacre directly inspired the creation of volunteer militia forces among the over-mountain men from the Watagan settlements at and near Sycamore Shoals. So, this battle was very important when it came to the Patriots getting more and more of the backwoodsmen to join their side. Because up until this point, you have to remember, the Siege of Charleston had just occurred, and Charleston had just fallen to the British. And so Patriot morale, mainly in the southern colonies, was very, very low. And defeats like this definitely wouldn't have helped them at all get recruits. So what happened was Congress took this event and use their propaganda, early propaganda machine, to kind of spin it around. It's almost like a rally call for people to join the Patriot cause, and it worked. In many battles from Camden to Guilford Courthouse to Cowpens, many American soldiers would shout, Remember Waxhaws, Remember Mac Waxhaws, or Tarleton's Quarter. And that's where this came from. So, although this was an American defeat... In the long run, it helped to secure an American victory. And that's why Waxhaws is a very important battle to look at. Even though it is somewhat short, there's so much that happened in such little time. Especially the whole mystery of, we don't know exactly what happened. Not one definitive account. Because, like I said earlier... Reports on both sides differ even from each other. Some British reports differ from other British reports, and that's one of the things that's very interesting about the Battle of Waxhaws.